Mark Madison, the historian at the National Conservation Training Center here in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. And tonight we are uh, going to screen a brand new American Experience documentary on Rachel Carson. And we're very fortunate uh, to have the two producers of this new film with us. Uh, we have Michelle Ferrari, who is the producer and director of the Rachel Carson film. And we have Raphael De La Uz, who is the producer and director of photography of this new film. So, Michelle, Raphael, welcome. We're very excited to see the film. I've seen it, actually, but the rest of the audience is. And uh, we appreciate you coming down here. Thanks for having Thanks for us. Thanks for having us. And I thought before we uh, show a, a clip of this new film, maybe it'd be interesting to learn just a little about both of your backgrounds. So why don't we start with Michelle, if you can just tell us sure. a synopsis um, of your CV. <laughs> a, a synopsis, a brief synopsis. Um, I was uh, um, working on a PhD in American history and um, had a friend who was making a giant series about the American West and he offered me a job. Um, and I've been working in historical film, mostly historical film, ever since. Um, done a lot of films for American Experience. Um, I've also worked on a number of films for HBO um, as a script supervisor and consultant. Um, and the films I've done for American Experience, I've written over a dozen. Um, and uh, direct. this is the second one that I've directed. Great. Rafael, tell us a little about yourself. I'm trained as a cinematographer. I started in Cuba, when that's where I'm from, and I graduated from the film school there, and came here to the United States and was working as a cinematographer, working documentaries, fiction films, and we crossed paths working for another company in a couple of documentaries. And so when Michelle decided to go on her venue as a director, his director adventure, she, she was a writer, trained as a writer, so we were friends and she said, well, I need some technical help with these things and so that's how we start working together and so that's how I became producer with her. Great. Mm -hmm. And of course this film is the culmination of both of your careers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, I really so. think it's a, yes, it a Citizen Kane of Carson documentaries. <laughs> <laughs> because and there are so many Carson documentaries. <laughs> exactly. Well, why don't we uh, show a clip because it's it's can be frustrating to talk about a film and not see any of it. And, and uh, Michelle, do you want to set up this sure. clip just a little? Um, this scene is about the moment when um, Rachel Carson's book, The Sea Around Us, uh, is first published and about its reception in the United States. Great. Go to the clip. By the time Carson's book went to print in the spring of 1951, the world seemed to be cleaving in two. The Soviet Union had shaken Americans' sense of security with a successful test of an atomic bomb. Communist forces had triumphed in China. Now there was a pervasive feeling that the struggle to stem the red tide would be unremitting. From the White House in Washington, D.C., President Harry S. Truman. My fellow Americans, I want to talk to you plainly tonight about what we are doing in Korea and about our policy in the Far East. In the simplest terms, what we're doing in Korea is this. We're trying to prevent a third world war. Against the backdrop of war, both hot and cold, Carson worried that her second book would founder like the first. But thanks to the New Yorker serialization, readers snapped it up all across the country and found in its pages an antidote to anxiety. The whole world ocean extends over about three-fourths of the surface of the globe. If we subtract the shallow areas of the continental shelves and the scattered banks and shoals, or at least the pale ghost of sunlight moves over the underlying bottom, there still remains about half the Earth that is covered by miles deep, lightless water that has been dark since the world began. Drawing upon all that was then known about the ocean, Carson told the story of its life over the eons and revealed a natural realm largely indifferent to the rhythms of man. It's a book that is jammed with news from the natural world. It's about currents, about the propagation of waves, about storm systems, about the ocean's relationship to climate. 
you have to remember that this is all new. Nobody knows what the ocean is like. So there's a lot of really compelling information that transcends that term. It's not just information, it's revelation. It's this immersive experience. It is a work of science, one critic raved. It is stamped with authority. It is a work of art. It is saturated with the excitement of mystery. It is literature. What she has done is to take a very complicated subject and distill it into its essence and bring the reader right there. So science, which can be extraordinarily impersonal and dry, has suddenly become immediate and very important. Three weeks after it appeared in bookstores, The Sea Around Us made the New York Times bestseller list. So that's enticing. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> yeah, very much so. And I'd have to say, as somebody who has seen the whole film um, and is a historian by trade, the uh, uh, some of the, the B-roll footage of the era is amazing. <laughs> I haven't seen it before. You guys must have killed yourself researching and, and procuring. We had, we had an amazing, amazing co-producer, Connie Honeycutt, who um, ferreted out every conceivable relevant piece of archival footage um, and more so, so that we had a ton of material to choose from. Um, and it's a very rich period to begin with. It's much more fun to make a 20th century film. Yeah. That <laughs> is more film footage based. than there was for exactly. <laughs> some of the early ones. How did you get involved with the Carson film? Um, it was actually, I was working with American Experience mm -hmm. to develop a new project, and we knew that we wanted to make a film that uh, addressed science and ethics, um, and that had a woman at the center. So we batted around a lot of ideas and mutually came to the conclusion that updating the film that they had made 20 years ago about Rachel Carson was absolutely the best thing to do because the message is so relevant to our current moment. So when you have a previous documentary, <clears throat> how do you differentiate your documentary from that one? Um, well, I feel like it was fairly easy to do, in part because that was a one-hour film and this is a two-hour film. True. Um, and they, the filmmakers on that film um, had access to a lot of people who knew Carson personally, many of whom had since died, so yes. that wasn't an option. Um, and they were very much more focused on the Silent Spring story. And while Silent Spring is obviously a big piece of our film, um, we wanted to get a little bit deeper into her life and had the time to do that. So they feel like very different films to me. Yeah, yeah, they actually are. And, and, and you're absolutely right. Some of the talking heads, Roland Clement and so on, really don't come into Carson's story till Silent Spring. And even Paul Brooks and so on tends to be focused on that. You, got, you have a much broader selection of, of spokespeople for Carson. What, um, what was the most important message you wanted to get out of this film? Well, I mean, I hope that people come away with a deeper understanding of the dynamics that are in play when we talk about the environment now. Um, because I think that um, Carson started a conversation and in many ways, we're still having that conversation. We're not talking about DDT anymore. Now we're talking about neonicotinoids mm -hmm. and fracking and climate change. Um, but the, the underlying dynamics of that conversation really haven't changed that much. And I think that, I, I think that the conversation is often unproductive. And I would love it if understanding the dynamics could help to make it a little bit more productive. Do you think understanding the dynamics does make it more productive? My logical brain does. <laughs> <laughs> My historian brain does. Yeah. As a, one of our uh, the people we interviewed says, there's a conversation that we still don't know how to have. Yeah. And I think that's very important. It's the conclusion of the conversation probably change. It depends on your ideology, your way you think about the world. <clears throat> but the conversation has to happen. And 
chief start their conversation. That's the most important part. Is we have to sit and talk about this. Ironically, Carson's one of the few people that may be as controversial today as, you know, 50 years ago. That doesn't often happen, right? We're not debating AC versus DC, mm -hmm. <laughs> right, 100 years mm -hmm. after Edison. Um, but there does seem to still be vociferous critics of, of Carson out there in the blogosphere. And, and, uh, it's great for the filmmaker. <laughs> it's great for the But do you maker. think they'll watch this film? <laughs> <laughs> well, the film is there. The, that's all we can do is to put the film in there. They watch it or no. But making a documentary about a character that is all answers, that you know everything, that everybody agrees, it's not that interesting. Having questions more than answers or certainty, I think it's more interesting. And it's great that there's still a debate about what you did. I think you'd be surprised how few people know about Carson, mm -hmm. actually. I mean, when I was growing up in the age of dinosaurs, uh, <laughs> we actually read Silent Spring in middle school, which is not the right age <laughs> for <laughs> to read Silent Spring, but it was seen as something that was important you did. And I think everybody at least knew of si uh, Silent Spring and Carson. And today, my undergraduates oftentimes are utterly unfamiliar even with the name, which I find extraordinary and all the more yeah. prescient. I mean, I'm not surprised by that at all because we spent more than a year making this film and talking to people about it. And I would say nine times out of 10, um, unless I was talking to someone who is in their late 50s, early 60s or older, or a school-aged person, mm -hmm. I got a blank look when I said I was making a film about Rachel Carson. Um, sometimes I would say she wrote Silent Spring and then there'd be a mm. glimmer <laughs> of yeah. recognition, but invariably you had to explain who she was. Um, Bill Souter, who's interviewed in the film, um, said to us when we interviewed him, although it's not in the film, that there's a donut hole in the population and there's just a, a big stretch of time in which it, she was not being taught in schools. Um, which is interesting in and of itself. Did you think she's coming back and being taught today? I think so. I mean, somebody asked me this question, um, you know, why did I think that was? And I think, well, you know, we had this sort of raft of environmental legislation in her immediate wake. Mm -hmm. um, and then, as we do, we took it for granted. And we took her role in it yeah. for granted. And now we're at this point where the environment is, again, a thing that's very much in the news and on people's minds. And so we're rediscovering the heroes of that story. Very cool. We kind of have a <coughs> unique situation here in that we have a cross-cultural perspective. Mm -hmm. was, was, was Carson known at all in no. Cuba? I, no, not to me. I mean, I don't know to other people, not to me. It's, it's unfortunate because her influence and her importance is, you cannot deny that. Um, it's unfortunate that when we think, this is a conversation that we have after our first day of interview, when you think about the very influential women in the history of the United States, you don't think about Rachel Carson. And her role is huge. Yeah. She changed the landscape. She did it. Um, so it's just, no, we, I, I didn't know anything about her until before we started doing the research for this film. How did you guys decide what the style of the film would be, how the film would look, and, and that applies to both the director and the <laughs> photography. When you come up with a subject, I mean, one has an idea of Edison might be sepia tone or <laughs> something because your images are, but with Carson, she cuts across, you know, um, the World War II, the Cold War, um, the age of film and radio. How do you, how do you set a tone for a, a documentary like that? I think it's like in every film, you have millions of conversations, you millions of ideas, and there's what happened in front of the camera. There's the two things you cannot ignore any of them. I always say, and we talk about that, films are made in pre-production, no in production. So all those conversations that we have and color, palette, and style, way to shoot, and all the things, you're not gonna do exactly that, or you, you don't know you're gonna be able to do it, but your choices and your, the, the answers that you're gonna have to the problems that you confront while you're filming, they're all defined by, by all the preparation you did. So we have um, 
all these ideas, but for sure there was something stuck in our mind was the 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 love for the ocean, how it is, the love for nature, how it is. We don't need to enhance nature. Let's don't go into cliches of um, sunsets, sunsets, and, <laughs> and sunrises, oh, okay. and all things. Uh, like you don't need if you love the ocean. The ocean of an oceanographer is not the ocean and the sunset when it actually looks like a swimming pool. Yeah, it's all calm. So it's, it's, if you love the ocean, you like the energy of the ocean. So that was kind of our our motto, trying to find the look and where we. We were on f very fortunate of start filming in Maine, right? But she did a lot of her research of all the, her nature uh, walks and the typos, and and it's beautiful. It's beautiful. So there was no a lot of problems. Yeah, to that's film quite a different there. ocean too than mm. the ocean of say yeah. the Pacific or even Florida, where she also did work. Yeah. But it's the main ocean is. Like and the sky today. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's darker, it's colder, it's... Uh... Well, there's a storm in the film that we actually went to film on purpose. We won the storm. We, 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 we were asking surfers, where's, where, where, where's the worst weather? Where can we go to get the, the big waves? Because we want to show that energy, that power that is fascinating. It's fascinating. And this conversation is fascinating because <laughs> uh, one of the things I liked about your film and. Uh, is it did focus on the ocean books. It, it, it gave due time to her, and here I'm parochial, but her time in the government service, which I think influenced her. But it strikes me it's perhaps challenging to make a documentary about somebody who's primarily an author as opposed to an airline pilot <laughs> or a parachutist. Or a dancer. Or a, or a dancer. <laughs> or a trumpet player. Yeah, and yeah. Um, yeah, somebody who lives through her words and so on. And I, we, we saw in that segment one way of, of um, depicting her books and opening it up. And that was kind of clever, actually. I enjoyed that. What, are, what were some of the challenges you faced with, with Carson as an author, somebody who left very little film footage of herself personally, and, and even relatively little audio of her? Um, how do you overcome that? What do you use? Well, um, as you saw in that clip, um, you know, we thought, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to render her words yeah. and, and the, the big books that we were focusing on in particular, which was The Sea Around Us and Silent Spring. Um, and for a while, we were trying to illustrate them almost literally, and that felt very wrong to me. I sort of felt like we needed to somehow capture the experience of reading a book. Uh -huh. So, with the sea around us, for example, she was describing things that most people had never seen. So, to just be watching kind of nature footage unadorned made no sense to me, because that would not be what was in your mind. What would be in your mind was something suggested by an illustration, maybe some photograph that you've seen, color. It would be m much dreamier. Um, so, that's kind of what we were going for with that stuff. Um, and then, you know, the fact that she was so connected to nature and um, happiest there um, gave us a lot of opportunities for visualization when footage of her was not available. Right. And it didn't feel like, as it can in film sometimes, like wallpaper, you know, or <laughs> vamping. Like, oh, we have nothing to show, so Here's now we're going to look at some tossing <laughs> trees, <laughs> you know. Monarch butterflies. Right. It made <laughs> seeing nature made sense in the context of the film, so. And it's not a film about nature. That's the important thing. It's, it's, it's when you go to these, uh, her books, the most important thing for us was that you get to know her more than the ocean. Yeah. If you want to learn about the ocean through Richard Carson, read her books. You don't need to watch our film. Right. The point of watching our film is to learn more about Rachel Carson. That's a good point. That's actually a very good point. In the clip we saw, there were some familiar voices there. How did you pick your narrator <laughs> and uh, the very famous actress who <laughs> reads Carson's work? Um, Oliver Platt, who narrated the film, narrates a great many American Experience films. Um, so he's sort of um, 
the series go to. Um, <laughs> um, not Peter Coyote. <laughs> no, not Peter Coyote. Um, they have, you know, really just two narrators that they use. So, um, but Mary Louise, I mean, we put a lot of thought into that, and it, it was a challenge because we should say the full name, Mary, Mary Louise. Yeah, Parker. sorry, Mary <laughs> Louise Parker. Great actress and does um, a good job. amazing actress, uh, and I knew her from way back when. We used oh, okay. to travel in similar so social circles. Um, but she, uh, the thing, the challenge was that you do actually hear Carson in the film. Um, True. And so you didn't want somebody who sounded like her, although she would never have been a voiceover artist, right. probably. Um, so in the world of actresses, you're unlikely to find someone who <laughs> sounds like her. Um, but I, I wanted somebody whose voice was sort of in the same timbre, um, who wouldn't call attention to the fact that it wasn't Rachel Carson's voice so much. I mean, I've seen a few other things about Rachel Carson, yeah. um, and Meryl Streep Meryl always Streep, yeah. reads the quotes, and Meryl Streep has a gorgeous voice, but you immediately think, Meryl Streep. Meryl Streep. <laughs> and I kind of didn't want that to happen. Um, and then I just think Mary Louise is incredibly smart, and she cares about the issues, and she's very impressed by Carson, and so I knew that she was going to render them with feeling. She brought a beautiful texture to the audio of the film. I still, when, when we were playing the clip, I still heard her voice and I love the texture that she brings to the audio tracks. It's beautiful. You know, Carson wrote a lot. I mean, she wrote mm -hmm. four books in her lifetime and, and numerous articles and a, a tremendous amount of material. How do you select the, the very few quotes that you can fit into Oof. even a two hour time? <laughs> It's all of it's eloquent, too. It would be yeah, easier yeah. if she, you know, mostly wrote mundane uh, stuff. Right. It's all well-written. No, it's, it's definitely a big challenge, and the, and the excerpts changed many times over the cor course of the film. I mean, sometimes there's a, a quotation that you just know has to be in, mm -hmm. but often you're shuffling pieces around and trying this one and trying that one, um, but the beautiful thing is when it's all good, you kind of can't go wrong. <laughs> 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 now you said you were focusing on uh, the sea around us and Silent Spring, uh, so I have to ask you what happened to the other two <laughs> books, Under the Sea Wind and The Edge of the Sea? Why why were they less compelling? Well, to story? it's not even that they were less compelling. I think they're equally compelling, and we do tell a little bit of, you know, each yeah. book. We we make mention of them, but you can only in a film write a book so many times. So if you try to do it three or four times, it becomes, there's no way for it not to feel redundant. So we focused on the sea around us because it was her first big bestseller right. um, and made her famous. And we focused on Silent Spring for obvious reasons. It allowed her to leave the Fish and Wildlife Service. <laughs> so we have mixed feelings about that book. Uh, it's very well written. Uh, also what we saw in that clip and, and what permeates this documentary and, and maybe more so than some of the previous treatments um, is the political context, even within her career, right? We often talk about the, the fallout from Silent Spring, but she, she dies, you know, a year and a half, two years after Silent Spring. And, and, um, but what were some of the political contexts that informed both her ocean books and Silent Spring? Well, I mean, I think... I, I it's really your whole documentary. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe just the highlights, but, but you do a good job of contextualizing it. The, you know, the nuclear era and the atmospheric testing, I think um, it's, a, it's a big backdrop in the film, and I think it was a big backdrop for Carson's life and career. Um, you know, she makes a link between uh, nuclear fallout right. and pesticides in Silent Spring, but that was much more than a convenient frame for her. Um, I really think that she was horrified by atomic testing. She was horrified by the bomb. <laughs> and I think it was really instrumental in her beginning to understand that it, nature could be ruined by the tampering hand of man. Um, and that changed the way she thought about the world and what she wanted to say. We have, I have this thing that I always say, Michel makes fun of me. When I said this, I said like every film is a Western, no matter what kind of film you make. Every film is a Western. 
So I, when we are talking in the office, I always try to explain things as a Western. So if you mind this film as a Western, you mind Richard Carson, you need to explain the town where the story happened. And you, it's very hard to understand the importance of what she did if you under, don't understand what's happening around her. Because the normal thing was to believe that pesticides, that nuclear development, the things were great for us. Right. It was very difficult, very difficult. With the resources she has, she's, in, she's reading books and reading articles and looking at typos, come to a conclusion that maybe there's something here that is missing, maybe it's something. It's very, very hard to do that. And you don't understand how difficult was that process if you don't understand the context of what's happening. I mean, the logic thing was to let's ride the wave of technology that is making us the most powerful country and the most powerful species or whatever you want to call it in the planet. And coming from a tight pool in Maine and saying, mm, maybe no, that's not the way we should go. It's incredible hard to do. No, it's a good point. I mean, right, the, the bomb in conjunction with pesticides helped win World War II. Mm -hmm. um, it was definitely was the high point of, of uh, scientific, you know, pride and, and, and confidence in scientists. So that raises the question, what caused Carson to, to doubt this? Why was she an iconoclast when everybody else was looking for better living through chemistry? <laughs> Well, I mean, I think she... Could it be her work with Fish and Wildlife Service? <laughs> well, I definitely... <laughs> I, I don't mean to lead you. I'm just no, joking. no, no, but I, I mean, I think that's part of it. I think, you know, um, she registered the damaging effects of fallout on probably a deeper level than many people did yeah. because she was familiar with all this research from the Fish and Wildlife Service from her early in her career, which showed that, yes, despite all the enthusiasm for this chemical, we should maybe be cautious. Um, and she was able to synthesize all that information, I think, in a way that um, made her uh, compelled to speak out. You know, one of the things about Silent Spring is, is it's, and that comes out in your film too, it's as much an ethical book mm -hmm. as it is a chemistry text or a, a a polemic against certain pesticides and so on, but oftentimes it's hard to, uh, in looking at Carson's books, particularly to see around us and uh, Silent Spring, to, to clearly define what her ethics were. Like you know Albert Schweitzer believed in a reverence for life or so on. It's easy to synthesize them. I wonder if working on this documentary for over a year, if, if you got a sense of what her ethical outlook mm. was beyond <clears throat> I think there's something deeper to her than just get rid of pesticides like DDT oh, and definitely. so on but I would argue even that that wasn't her ethic I don't think she advocated getting rid of DDT right. at all um, I, I mean I, it's a very good question and a big question and I hesitate so much <laughs> to answer it um, but for me I think it's about being cautious and mm. measured um, she wasn't a Luddite, right. um, but she thought that we should ask more questions than we typically do. And that's still going on. That still happens. I mean, my favorite example is the, what's the drug they give for osteoporosis? There are two different, <laughs> two different ones. And they prescribed it wildly to everyone. Um, and then they discovered that it caused necrosis of the bone. <laughs> so the exact opposite thing yeah, of what right. it was supposed to do. Um, and I think, you know, th that sort of dynamic um, was disturbing to her. Um, she understood that we needed to progress and that we couldn't ask every question under the sun, but a few more. Move at a slightly slower pace. Be a slight bit more careful. A precautionary principle? Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if I can answer your question, but... Something that impressed me is the, she was so in love with nature, with the planet, that she was able to distance herself for everything that could be called noise or hype of everything that was surrounded her. 
And even if she became a successful writer, if you see she didn't move to New York. No. They publish in Paradise. No. She, she bought a college <laughs> in May. Yeah. The, a place by the then. New York. <laughs> by then you couldn't even go there in the winter. Right. Because there was no plumbing. Yeah. So it's a, it's this, so she stay focused on what she believed and what her passion is. And that was her strength. She was able to look at everything from that place. And that's why I'm not sure that, as I say, I'm not sure that answered the question about her ethic, but she was in a very strong position. And you can come to the conclusion that she was right or she was wrong. That it doesn't matter. But she you, was right. But you know what she's, you know where, where you know what she's talking about, and you yeah. know where, what corner of the room she right. is, and it's hard to ignore that. She had a lot of integrity. She did. Yeah. She had great integrity. Yeah. And, and it's interesting hearing your answers. It, it, it makes me think that working on a film for over a year is the equivalent of working on a PhD. In that <laughs> you get so <laughs> deep into the subject. Um, it can be hard to answer big questions in, in simplistic ways because there are complexities there. You mentioned something that that is important um, to talk about. What was her attitude towards pesticides as opposed to the simple gloss? She just wanted mm -hmm. to ban them all. That was not her attitude. So Not at all. Um, you know, she understood the need for pesticides and she was in no way arguing that they shouldn't be used. She was arguing against the heedless use of them, the misuse of them, the wild let's, you know, drench the nation yeah. in pesticides approach. Um, and, you know, this is why the, the current critique of Carson um, and the notion that, you know, she's killed millions of children in Africa right. is so maddening because when people make that argument, first of all, they reveal immediately that they didn't read Silent Spring. Right. And then they ignore the fact that, you know, Carson didn't ban DDT. The government and did. Ten years ten, after exactly. Silent Spring, yeah. And it was only banned in the United States. <laughs> right. So um, the, there's just a, a whole heap of misinformation and myth in that argument um, that I hope gets unraveled a little bit. She, she said something on the CBS report, it's in, a, in our film, the, I think it's very pertinent. She's, well, the chemist, the chemist industry is talking about the advantage and of these things, the the use of of all these products, but they don't really know right. the consequence and the long run of using this. And they are telling us that this is great, but they don't know if it's great. And that's a word of cautious. I mean, if I tell you that driving when you're drinking is a bad thing, you can tell me, well, I've done it 25 times and right. not, never, ever, nothing happened. But the thing is one day something is gonna happen. So be conscious about it, that it can be dangerous. I don't think it's a wrong message. Let's talk, let's and separate that from the, the importance in eradicate malaria in some places, where it can be useful and important. But at least let's get to know this thing before we say this is the greatest thing in the world. I think that's absolutely true in the <laughs> testimony. I'm curious, uh, you mentioned the CBS documentary, which is a really mm -hmm. interesting documentary. I, was it 62 that Severide did mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. What did you guys think when you saw that? Because I'd been studying Carson for decades before I ever saw that documentary. What did you guys make of that? I thought it was really interesting the way in which they CBS basically let the officials sink themselves because what became clear even as people were touting the benefits of pesticides was that they didn't have any answers about anything um, and that was exactly her point so it just proved her point um, you know and I to just to go back to what Rafa was saying a minute ago it's like you know if at the same time um, that we're blanketing the earth with pesticides. We know that it's killing birds and fish. You would think that you would at least look into that. Well, let's pull back our use a little bit until we can figure out what this is about. Um, and that, I think, would be Carson's approach. Not ban it, just 
check it out. It's a good point. Unfortunately, the the two agencies in charge of investigating yeah. <laughs> and then using were separated mm -hmm. in, in yeah. different departments and and. It was even clear in the CBS document it really didn't have a lot in common with each other. When right. you when you talk to the uh, head of the Department of Interior, the USDA head, they, they weren't even talking about the same thing. Right. One book we haven't talked about, <clears throat> that's a short book published posthumously, but one that's kind of come back to resonate a little today is The Sense of Wonder. Sense of Tell wonder. us a little about that book. Because a lot of people actually that watch this broadcast might never have heard of that book, but it does come up in the documentary, and certainly the context for it with Roger does. Right. No, I mean, it's it's a beautiful book, and, um, you know, it, it captures, I think, um, what was her sense of wonder, and it's about how you should interact with children and get them to appreciate the world that we live in, the natural world. Um, and she tells a story about taking... Roger down to the beach yeah. at night, um, which is quite beautiful. Um, we couldn't find a place for it in the film, which <laughs> made me sad, um, but I hope people will get excited about Carson's books and check that one out. It's an easy read. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's expansion from an article. Right. Um, she probably needed that book after writing <laughs> Silent Spring, <laughs> because Silent Spring is such a departure for all the beautiful things she has written. She probably needed that book so bad. <laughs> More than kids, she needed that book. Well, it's, it's, it, it, once again, like Silent Spring, seems to come out of left field from what she's written previously, primarily on oceans. And, well, and, uh, Silent Spring is really out of left field. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's the thing, you yeah. know? It's like, that's the book people know, so everything else seems weird. But no, it's Silent Spring that's <laughs> yeah, weird. Yeah, that's the odd one out. But <laughs> it seems today with all the discussion about getting youth into nature and so on, she actually, with Roger, um, set up a pretty... Um, cogent way to introduce them to nature. Which raises another question. For the film, how did you choose um, who the spokespeople would be on, on camera? Um, you got quite a cross-section <laughs> compared yeah. to the previous documentary. Um, you know, I'm, we definitely wanted to talk to Roger, her adopted son, mm -hmm. um, and to Martha Freeman, Dorothy Freeman's yeah. granddaughter, because they knew her. Right. So anyone who actually laid eyes on her in life. There aren't many left. <laughs> yeah, who yeah. wanted in the film. Um, her biographers seemed obvious choices. Right. Um, Mark Lytle and Linda Lear and William Souter. Um, and then because the scientific climate um, was a big part of the story that we wanted to tell, we talked to a lot of historians of science and people who had written about DDT from a non-biographical perspective. Right. Um, so that was um, David Kinkella and Naomi Oreskes and mm -hmm. Deborah Blum. Did I leave anybody out? No. Okay. I, was, I was doing the math in my head. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think people are curious who aren't filmmakers, how do you get um, the talking heads to say what you want them to say. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because they have to carry, carry the narrative through, right? They're there to, to, to complete all, the story. It's all about the questions. You have to really think through what, um, what's going to, how do you frame the question that's going to yield the answer that you want? And also, you're not looking for so sound bites. We learn as much from our interviewees as we try yeah. to get you know, mastermind what they say. Um, so they will say things that we weren't expecting at all, but that informs how we integrate them into the script and changes the story. Um, but I do think the art of a good interview is good questions. I'm well, listening, I'm listening, listening. I've been with directors that don't listen. They just go there to get what they want. So they don't listen to the subject. And is terrible. Yeah, it really needs to be a conversation. Last technical question, then we'll go to mm -hmm. a, a final legacy question. But what was the hardest part about editing this film? I know that's often <laughs> the biggest challenge in a documentary. There's many hard parts, but it probably varies from film to film, I can, subject to subject. I can tell you for me, um, which I probably have different. It was different for me, but the, for, the hardest part for me was something that we talked about earlier. It was very easy to make this film into a film of the beauty of nature. Mm -hmm. And you finished watching that and you felt like I didn't get to know her. 
I didn't get to know. I always want the film to be kind of like this luxurious, unique opportunity to sitting with Richard Carson at the table and have a coffee and look at her in the eyes and learn, listen to it. And that was the very, because we have so many beautiful footage, we film very early, we have drum footage. So it was very attractive. It was, a, it was very easy to fall on that path yeah. and just recreate yourself with the beauty and beauty and beauty and beauty. And Treasure Castle will kind of disappear under the ocean, literally, <laughs> under the ocean. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, that was the hardest part on the editing process, to keep the focus. Well, we I think it. you kept the focus. <laughs> the pretty well. How about you, Michelle? Um, well, I think it's related. I think, you know, one of the big challenges was just the overall tone of the film uh -huh. um, and the balance between Carson's story and the story of the pro proponents of pesticides. Um, you know, a lot of treatments of the Silent Spring story really portray it as a David and Goliath yes. kind yeah. of battle. And we really didn't want to do that. We wanted to understand the impetus for these, for something like pesticides. We wanted to understand the people who would advocate them, support them, and yeah. support their use. And we really wanted there to be what was a real tension. It, I didn't want it to feel um, predetermined. And so getting that right um, was a challenge. And then two, Carson is, um, She's really hard to poke holes in. I mean, she truly is uh, an heroic figure. And so we had to guard against it feeling like hagiography. Hey, <laughs> yeah, you're right. And she doesn't seem to have any vices. <laughs> she's not arrogant. She's not a drinker, a gambler, nothing. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I actually hadn't thought of that before. Uh, and it might have been one of the reasons she's often portrayed as, as in heroic yep. uh, phrasing. But she is a person. She yeah. raises Roger. She works hard. <laughs> She's not paid well early on. <laughs> she has resentments and unrealized dreams, and we wanted all that stuff to come through. Last question. I, I, I think it's interesting that this is coming out now, um, several decades after the earlier one, and, and probably uh, a fair number of the audience might be unfamiliar with Carson, and so I'm curious, you know, what you would like them to take away from Carson. It's one thing for somebody like me or somebody my age to to watch this, and they probably read Silent Spring, and um, it reinforces our emulation of Carson. But if, if you were totally unexposed to Carson, never heard of her, um, what would you hope they would take away after this two-hour documentary? Well. First of all, that she is, I mean, most historians agree, she's one of the most significant Americans of the 20th century. And you really should know who she is. Yes. And probably before you know who Marilyn Monroe is. You know? <laughs> Definitely. More important than Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> um, so that, I hope, would be a takeaway. Um, and then, you know, I hope that people hear what she had to say. I mean, an important part of telling this story now is bringing her message to a new audience. And that message absolutely bears repeating. And would the message be what you said earlier about being cautious? I mean, obviously DDT is not the main issue right. today, but with all our environmental issues. Yeah. Is there anything you hope? Yeah, I think, I think hopefully people come out of the film thinking, we need to ask questions. We need to ask questions. Everything. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how convinced is the society. It doesn't matter how the context pushes in one way. It doesn't matter how much we believe in something. Ask questions. Question everything. There's always another side of the story of everything. It's a good way to go out on asking questions. I think. Um, the incredible, thoughtful discussion I've had with you two is a, is a good indicator of what a very thoughtful documentary this is. It really does add a tremendous amount to what we know about Carson, and it's uh, presented in an amazingly 
educational and entertaining way. Usually you get one or the other. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> both came together. Uh, and uh, although we are going to screen it out here, I'd like folks to know that it will be airing on January 24th between 8 and 10 p.m. on PBS's American Experience. So check your listings. You can definitely watch it there. And thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Raphael. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so really much. Fun. It was thank great. You.